Thank you. Um, so, good morning, everyone. Thank you for making it to my uh, early but slightly delayed, delayed talk. Um, yeah, so my name is Yulia. I do work at Mozilla. I work at Firefox. Uh, and um, my talk will be about side effects, which, uh, and specifically side effects within the realm of front-end programming and uh, more specifically in terms of React, though I've tried to make this more general. Uh, we had a really great uh, introduction to this by Anna yesterday. Uh, so she spent, I think, about five, 10 minutes on this topic. I'm gonna spend 40. Um, so let's, let's just start off with talking about what, I, what I'm working on. Um, I'm working on the browser, and more specifically, I'm working on this part of the browser. I work on the debugger. Some of you may be familiar with this thing. Some of you may hate it because you usually use the debugger when, uh, when you're frustrated because the debugger is the thing that most programmers go to when they can't figure out what's wrong with their code through a console.log. Um, yeah, so this is what I'm working on. And uh, what a lot of people don't know is that uh, this particular part of the Firefox browser is actually a web view. It's done entirely in JavaScript and uh, web technologies. It's JavaScript and CSS. And um, it is uh, its own repository. It's separate from Mozilla. So Mozilla Central is the main repo that most of the Firefox code is. This thing runs separately. And there's a couple of reasons for that I'm going to get into. Uh, this is what my day-to-day -day work looks like for the most part. So uh, we've got a uh, one browser and another browser. Uh, the browser on the right-hand side is uh, running the debugger code, which is a React application, as I mentioned. And the other browser is running uh, some website that we're debugging. We can see the sources here and then the text contents of the sources over there. And uh, essentially, this relationship is called, a, in terms of how we talk about it, is a debugger debuggy. Um, relationship, so the debugger and its target, what we're looking at. Now, some days it's not quite so clear for me, and I don't have such a nice workflow. It instead looks something more like this, in which I have the debugger debugging the debugger that's debugging the target. Um, these days are a little bit frustrating for me because I'm like, oh, what's going on, what's wrong? It gets worse, to be completely honest, because sometimes I have to go into the panel with the panel debugger that's also running the web view, debugging the debugger that's debugging the debugger that's debugging the target. I wish this was the end of it. Sometimes we have this one pop up as well. This is the browser debugger, which is also running a web view, which is debugging the browser that's running the debugger that's debugging the debugger that's debugging the debugger that's debugging the target. This is my life. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I really, uh, this project is really fun to work on, I gotta say, uh, except for when it's not. And um, <laughs> yeah, uh, what we're gonna be talking about for the most part is uh, the UI side of the debugger. There is another part to this, uh, which is the server of the debugger, um, but we're not gonna get into it because that would be just like a totally different talk. It's super interesting, but we can't talk about it just yet. So uh, let's say you're writing a piece of JavaScript and uh, you want to debug it. Let's say you're trying to figure out what's going on with this return x dot a um, method. Uh, you're doing a method uh, uh, acquisition or you're pulling up a method from something and it's not working. And uh, all you have access to is the engine. And the engine has a C++ bytecode emitter and it tells you this. This is really helpful, isn't it? What's going on here? Uh, this is what the engine is giving us back when we're asking it uh, what's happening in this code. And if you are a front-end developer, you're gonna have to spend a bit of time looking at this and being like, nah. So that's where UI comes in, and UI is super important. Um, and uh, so I'm, I said that I would talk a little bit about why we decided to use React on the front end, and there's a couple of reasons. Uh, n not least of all is that we use web technologies at Mozilla because we really believe in the web. And using something like React helps us understand the users of the web a bit better because we're using the same technology to build this thing that they also use themselves in their day-to-day. -day. Now, there was a previous version of the debugger that came before this one. And that one was, it's really scary, it was object-oriented, and it was written in this thing. It's called, oops, it was called Zool. Uh, so in the earlier days of the debugger, in the earlier days of the web, uh, we didn't have such great 
tools in HTML and JavaScript and CSS to really do components and positioning. So the solution that Mozilla came up with was an internal network called Zool, uh, which looks a lot like HTML, but it's not HTML, and uh, comes up with little widgets like this. And this is what the debugger used to be written in. We moved away from this because um, we discovered, as did many front-end developers as they were trying to get these complex object-oriented systems to work together, that um, uh, this probably wasn't the right way to do it, that there must be a better way. And this is where I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna say I actually really like JavaScript because JavaScript is this incredible place where uh, lots of different disciplines are coming together very quickly. We're seeing um, influences from functional programming, from database research, from uh, compilers, fr from everywhere. It's, uh, it's fascinating. And uh, like, I really like this picture because we've got like, these cute little uh, uh, fruits. And there's one who's like, what's this pointy thing? Of course, it's not like a perfect world. Um, but uh, this is also another talk. So um, going back to the problem of state in a front-end application. Uh, and let's actually just take another look at this, uh, at this um, breakpoint that we're looking at here. Uh, the problem of state in a front-end application is often that you want to show uh, multiple different versions of the same data in different ways. Like in this case, we're looking at the breakpoint as a little marker, but sometimes we might want to see all of the breakpoints as a list. Sometimes we want, might want to see different data about the breakpoint. And if you have this as an object, and you've got lots of different objects floating around in your uh, application, it's difficult to keep track of them. And that's when uh, functional programming started to become really useful in, in UIs. Because uh, I'm sure as many of you have experienced, it's kind of difficult to have a, a computer program without any state at all. And functional programming would require that, like if we went completely pure and had no state at all, well, how would you know when you're like doing something in an application? Like, how would you change anything? And that's where the idea of the central store came from, because, um, and that's the idea that Flux is uh, largely based on, which is it's better to have a global store than to have multiple little buckets of data. So Flux is the React lingo for um, this type of data flow, uh, which also has this centralized store concept in it, and what, it, what Flux basically is, is a way to deal with uh, data updates that's linear, goes in one direction, and uh, is easy to follow, easy to think about. We had this, of course, in Anna's talk as well. I'm gonna talk about it super briefly. So uh, let's say you've got a UI event, and that UI event triggers an action constructor. This is one addition to Anna's version of this slide. The action constructor is basically the same thing as just writing the action and hard coding the action. But uh, instead, like maybe you want something that's, that changes on every click. Like if you click on a certain element, you want to add some data, something like this. That, that, we're gonna take a look at a code example of that in a second. The dispatcher takes the action and it takes your reducer code uh, and uh, says, here's an action, which is a simple object, and uh, do something with this. And then the reducer says, okay, I'll update the state with it, or something like that. And then uh, the reducer um, combines the store with that new data and passes that down back into the UI basically what Anna was talking about yesterday. Uh, here's a code, like super simplified code example of an action creator. Um, we've got a basic function that's wrapping the uh, callback that gets called by whatever it is that you're gonna call. And uh, this dispatch um, function that will then pass in the simple object. So this simple object has a type of basic action and a bit of data called message with the string hi. The dispatcher is taking this simple object and taking it over to the reducer, which is, uh, has this update function. And you'll see the action is the same one that we just saw. Uh, we have a switch statement that says, okay, if the action.type is this one, the one that we've just defined, uh, we will uh, return and update the state. We've only got one piece of data in that state, which is message and um, return that. Otherwise, we're gonna return the state as it is. You always have to return the state from a reducer, otherwise uh, you completely clear your state. All right, so um, that's the quick uh, review of what we had yesterday. Uh, let's take a look at what happens when we have async data flow. Now, um, the thing about this 
uh, thing that we've just discussed is that we're talking about a central store for state, and that state is a very specific state. It's application state. However, what happens if we have to deal with state that is an application state? And you might ask, well, what kind of state might that be? That kind of state is uh, perhaps process state. And uh, asynchronous uh, code is by nature stateful because a piece of async, uh, something that is asynchronous, we have to remember. We have to remember that something has to come back. If it was something that we're like firing and forgetting, we don't have to think about it. But now we've introduced a piece of state and we don't know how to reconcile it with our existing flow. Let's take a look at two options. There are two strategies, and these are again a review from yesterday. Uh, we've got Redux Thunk and we've got Redux Saga. Uh, these are super small right now. We're going to take a look at them in more depth in a moment, but before we get into this, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what asynchronous means in the world of JavaScript. So let's understand these methods. I'm not going to go really far into the history because I'm not actually sure how much time, my timer is not working, so I'm not sure how much time I've got. Um, yeah, let's uh, talk about async in JavaScript. We have uh, the promise, which pro likely many of you are familiar with. It was introduced in ES um, 2015. Uh, we have async await, which was introduced in ES 2016, 17, or next. I'm not really sure where, when this was really uh, specified. And we're also going to talk about generators, which, you know, looking at the other two, it might not be immediately clear how generators relate to these two, but we're going to get into it in a second. All right, let's start off with promises. So a promise looks something like this. A promise is uh, it's a function that can be instantiated with a new keyword, and it takes a callback, which has a, a resolve and reject function on it. And uh, let's say uh, you do something like set timeout or fetch, or maybe you're doing Ajax in here. Like anything that's asynchronous or uh, talks to a web API, can be put into a promise. Uh, workers are another example. And let's say that somewhere up here we define a success, and if it's successful, we resolve with response, otherwise we reject. Then when we're using it, uh, let's say after that promise has completed, um, because also, just one more thing about this promise object, uh, what gets put into this async uh, function uh, variable isn't the result, it isn't what's coming out of here. It's going to be an object with three states, uh, done, error, and uh, pending. So from this object, we have two methods, then and catch. Then can be chained as long as you return something. So uh, let's say we're returning a result and then we can continue chaining on this and using, uh, consuming those values in other parts of the chain block or we can catch through an error, or we can catch, say, that error isn't very important, return again, and then continue chaining with the then. This was a huge improvement over what we had before in JavaScript. Before, you had Ajax, and before Ajax, you had XHR, XML, HTTP request, which was very difficult to work with. You would have either have a while pole, um, a long pole, or a while loop, or something to make sure that, oh, this thing has returned, something like this. Um, there's one problem with this. Uh, what happens when you want to use that result outside of the scope of this callback? Well, this won't work, right? And why won't this work? Well, it has to do with how asynchronicity works in JavaScript. It won't work because of how um, uh, promises work within the realm of the call stack, the web APIs, and the event loop. Now, let's say you uh, have two functions calling each other uh, the first one calls the second function, and the second function calls a promise. When that promise gets called, uh, it is essentially a call to a web API, which isn't part of the JavaScript runtime. It's outside of the JavaScript runtime. It gets moved over there, and this runtime takes care of uh, completing whatever it needs to do before saying, okay, now we can evaluate whatever is in that callback. That means that whatever you've written in your code, that you're seeing in your code, is actually completely outside of uh, the block of code that you've written. So this has to, uh, this happens, but this has to clear before that calculation can be done, whatever that calculation is. Only when the call stack is empty does that, re that, does that call back get called. Now, um, there's a really great talk about this. It's by uh, Philip Roberts. If you want to learn more about the call stack, he's a really great resource. 
uh, but I just wanted to quickly explain why this is an issue. Okay, so let's say you want to use a promise. You have to put anything you want to use inside of that promise, inside of the promise chain, so that you can use that value, consume that value in some way. But what if you have another asynchronous function in there? And then suddenly things start to get deeply nested. And that's bad, because you can't read it. It's going to start to, it's going to become really hard to comprehend what's going on here. And that's why a promise as async await uh, came about. So async await is essentially a syntactic sugar on top of promise. Uh, on top of the Promise API. And we've, uh, what we've got here is essentially the same code that we saw back here, uh, but instead, what we're doing is we have uh, two new keywords, async and await. Async says that this function will be, uh, will be asynchronous, and inside of it we can await the result from a promise, which is our async function here, and then use it almost as though it was synchronous. So um, this makes it like when you're working with really complex promise chains, this makes it easier to look at, which in turn makes it easier to comprehend what's happening in the code. Cool. So this, um, this pretty much brings you up to date with that. And there's one last thing that I want to talk about, and it might seem a little bit esoteric. It might be not entirely clear why I'm talking about it right away. And this is generators. Generators are notoriously difficult to understand, and there's a good reason for this. Uh, because you need to think a little bit in loops when working with them. Generators are essentially functions that can be paused. Um, they can be paused uh, using this yield keyword. And you define a generator using function star. So what's interesting about generators is that they are both data producers and data consumers. And what we're looking at here is an example of a generator as a data producer. Uh, here, uh, I don't know if any of you are contemporary art fans, studied it. Uh, this is a boys generator. Boys was an American and German artist, and he has this one song that goes, yaw, 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 nay, 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 and just keeps on going back and forth. I think it's a comment on something, but yeah. Uh, so um, we've got two yield statements, uh, and the first one is uh, yielding the string, ya ya ya. The second one is yielding, nay, nay, nay. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's the only thing that this generator does. We instantiate the generator right here as an instance uh, in this ya9 uh, variable, and then we call the method next. Um, and uh, so the generator, when it's instantiated, it basically just returns you a simple object with a next method on it. When you call next, you get that value, and you have a second value called done false. And you call it again, you get the second value, pausing again at this point in the function, uh, this time getting the second uh, value that is produced. And again, the value falls, uh, the status falls. And the third time you run it, you get an undefined value and a done true. Great, this is pretty easy to understand. Okay, now I'm going to go into the risky part, and I'm going to actually do some code in on live. I hope you guys can still hear me. Uh, because I think, I think it's a little bit difficult to understand what goes on with generators unless you kind of see what's happening. So, um, yeah. can everybody see that? Okay. Let's write our own generator. We have a function star, and it's going to be called oh no live code. And it's not going to take any arguments. And uh, I'm going to use a let, so this is something we're going to redefine, and it's going to be called answer. This is the second part of what generators do, which is that they are data consumers. So answer is going to get data from somewhere. And here we are using the yield keyword again. And what are we yielding? We're going to yield a question. Any, any favorite questions that I should ask? No. OK, fine. Anything? No. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite color? Uh, let's use that. Okay. And uh, just to make it easy for the sake of this demo, you don't need this next part, but for the sake of the demo, I'm just going to write it in. I'm going to do a while we have an answer. We're going to loop over it. And we're going to do console.log answer. And. Oh. oh, thank you. It's like pairing a lot of people. Uh, and then we're going to uh, redefine the answer so that we can keep going with the loop uh, as, again, 
typo in there too. Okay, so we've just written our own uh, our own generator. Okay, cool. And this is this is uh, already in most browsers. Like this is just Firefox that we're running here. There's no libraries that are transpiling this or anything like that. Let's instantiate it as uh, hi. Okay, so we have um, an instance of oh no live code, and uh, let's talk to hi and say next. Next. And uh, so I already know what the question is. Uh, but for the, uh, I'm, I'm not going to enter an empty thing into here for now. Uh, we'll see that in a second. But let's let's pass something to next. Let's pass. My favorite color is blue. All right. And suddenly we have, um, what is your favorite color? And uh, the object value, right? But if I do it again, you'll see that the console log is being triggered. So uh, I passed into the next an argument. And we're looking at this piece of code as responsive. And I can do that again. And I can change my answer. And then suddenly we're talking to the console log again in that while loop. And this is what it means when we say that generators are both data producers and data consumers. Um, here, I'm going to grab the mic again. Uh, here we have what is your favorite color? This is producing data. And here we've got the answer green, which is. Uh, talking back, the data is being consumed by the generator. Um, so there's a quote. Oh, we got to get out of the console log first. Right. So there's a quote coming from um, his name is escape, escaping me right now, but he um, he runs a, a blog called Tuality. It's an excellent, excellent blog. Um, and uh, this is from the chapter on generators uh, on the ES6 uh, book online. Uh, generators are functions that can be paused and resumed. Think cooperative multitasking or coroutines, which enables a, a variety of applications. This is a difficult statement to unpack. It's very vague. And uh, it might be surprising to realize that uh, a lot of people, the minute that they said generators, they were like, wait a second, we can use this for promises. We can use this to make promises easier to look at. Because generators are the code that lives underneath async await. Async await uses generators to make promises easier to look at. Great, OK, so this is, um, oh, also I just wanted to mention there's another video. Uh, it was mentioned to me by Anjana. Uh, I watched it last night. It's really good. It's Bodil, uh, oops, Bodil's talk, uh, The Miracle of Generators. And she essentially talks about um, how to use generators in the context of promises to make promises easier to read. This is, of course, a little bit before async await was added to the spec, uh, but uh, it'll give you an idea of how to use generators to essentially write your own version of async await. All right, so why did I spend some t so much time on this particular topic? Well, we're going to get into that in a second. Let's take a look at uh, our two potential solutions to our asynchronous problem in JavaScript, where we've got state. We don't know where to put that state because it's not application state. We don't want to add that to our uh, reducer store. Uh, and uh, how do we actually handle that? Uh, the most common solution uh, is Redux Thunk because uh, it's a very simple solution. Um, and it works for most cases. It's also recommended, I believe, by the React handbook or the Redux handbook. I'm not too sure where it's recommended right now, but it's, it's very often recommended, and there's good reason for it. It's written by Dan Abramov, and um, it's been worked on by a number of very smart people. Uh, the word th I like looking into uh, where things come from in JavaScript, because you often find really interesting little uh, ways and alleys and things like this that you can wander down and discover interesting things about computer science uh, through just figuring out what the name means. And in the case of uh, thunk, uh, th uh, the, the word thunk is jocular to, uh, for to have thought. So uh, who would have thunk it? Like you know this statement, who would have thunk it? It's like who would have thought of that? Uh, and it comes from compiler theory. The guy who introduced it, he was working on Agol 60. I had to look this up. Uh, and he was writing about what to do when you have, for example, like a piece of code 
and you've got an expression that might vary, that might change, like a mathematical expression that needs to be evaluated. And what thunks were in the compiler world was a, um, was a subroutine, a subprocess, that would be branched from the parent, do that evaluation, come back with the answer, and then the parent would continue on with its evaluation. The way that it's implemented in, um, in Redux, in the JavaScript world, is a little different. Uh, there's a few similarities, but uh, it's a little bit, like there's, there's a certain inspiration, and you'll see where that comes from in a second when we get to the next part. So uh, thunks, uh, Redux thunk is basically a middleware that wraps your dispatcher. So it modifies the dispatcher. The dispatcher isn't the same dispatcher as the one that you have in pure Redux. Uh, in that, um, it creates a piece of middleware called promise. And uh, if you need it, it will then talk to your asynchronous services. Let's take a look at it in code. So uh, you remember the basic action creator we had in the previous uh, version of this basic action. We now have the basic ap action and we've got this promise middleware in here. And it's taking an asynchronous function and it's uh, awaiting an asynchronous operation. Uh, the original message was hi and now we've got hi user. The user is being retrieved from some service or something like this. But uh, as you can see, this is all being done in the action. Now, uh, traditional Redux requires that actions are simple objects. A promise is not a simple object. So this, this modification, the reason that dispatch is being modified for this is to allow non-simple objects to be passed to the reducer. Now the reducer looks something like this. Uh, okay, I lied in that late, last statement and I'll explain in a second why. Uh, we still have our basic action uh, and we still have our case statement, but now we've got an if block, two if blocks. If it's at start, we return the original message that we passed to it, and if it's done, uh, we pass it a, a new message that comes from action.value. Okay, what the heck is going on here? Let's take another look at this uh, bit of code. What's happening here is this dispatcher is being called twice. When uh, it gets called the first time when the promise is just started. So we get the message hi and the, uh, the done operation here, uh, this, the start here. And then it gets called again when the promise finishes, and now we've got new data. And then we've got done. There's another way to look at this block of code. Uh, this block of code is two nested switch statements. So you've got uh, the action, basic action, and then you've got two more conditions that could potentially be fulfilled. So there we go, there you have it. That's how thunks work. They work by uh, wrapping your action uh, using that complex object calling the uh, update function of the reducer once before that complex, um, uh, before that promise is resolved and once after. Let's take a look at another solution. This is Redux Saga. Um, yeah. Sagas are also very interesting word in terms of computation. So I, uh, if you read the uh, documentation on Redux Saga, you'll come across um, their inspiration for this method and it comes from the database community and it comes from database uh, long life transactions. So there's a, pap uh, there's a paper, it's by uh, Hector Garcia Molina and Kenneth Salem. Uh, they wrote it I believe in the 1980s or the 1970s. Uh, the previous paper was written in 1961 uh, by uh, Peter Ing Ingerman and this one was written about 20 years later or something like this. Uh, and they, there's a quote in there which is a little bit funny, they're like, okay, the solution is really obvious, but we're just formalizing it. Essentially, uh, a saga, uh, in the case of a database, in the case of the database community was, a long life transaction is a saga if it can be written as a sequence of transactions that can be interleaved with other transactions. Um, there's another, uh, there are a couple of other important factors in, uh, in sagas, which is that uh, there is a much more fine-grained, it's a much more fine-grained approach. You have a lot more control because you're expecting many things to happen. Uh, now this isn't coming from this paper, this is coming from uh, the Redux implementation of it, which is that um, unlike thunks, Thunks are sort of expecting a simple thing to happen. They're expecting one or maybe two asynchronous calls to happen. 
Sagas are expecting multiple things to happen. They're expecting a lot of things to happen. And they're structured differently than um, the Thunksari, specifically in that we are no longer talking about a wrapped dispatcher. We're talking about another service that's listening to the dispatcher. The dispatcher is dispatching its actions. This service is just listening to them. It's not, it's not modifying them in any way. It's just listening. And it's doing its own thing and then dispatching its own actions. So um, this, is a, this is one of the main fundamental differences. Uh, like once you start working with Redux Thunk, you might find that things are starting to become very netted, very knotted, like things are starting to bleed into each other. You're writing a lot of the same code over and over again. Whereas with sagas, uh, you just write the dispatchers. The dispatchers are simple. Uh, not the dispatchers. The actions are simple. Uh, the sagas are more complex. OK, let's take a look. Uh, let's just take a look at the code, because it becomes very clear when you see it written out. Um, we're now looking at the exact same action that we looked at at the beginning, when we were discussing basic uh, flux patterns, when we were discussing the basic Redux implementation. We have our type, and we have our, our data that we're passing in. We're not, we're not doing anything fancy here. Then we have our, oops, then we have our sagas. Uh, the saga is where things get a little bit interesting. And this is why I wanted to introduce everyone to generators before we got to this point. We have uh, a generator that's watching. So we're watching basic action. And we're taking every basic action and passing it into basic saga. Basic saga is also a generator, which is awaiting the async operation and uh, yielding put. We're going to get into what all of this stuff means in a second. I just wanted to show you like what a saga looks like. It's done with generators. It's, we're not using async await. We're using generators. And uh, that's what it looks like. And uh, just to remind you what the dispatch, which those last, these last two pieces of code are doing the same thing as this thing is doing. Okay. So this has the promise, and it's got the message. So this looks simpler. Uh, but it's doing more behind the scenes than what the sagas are. All right, and with the saga, we now have um, an update that instead of having nested case statements, has a flat uh, hierarchy of case statements. So we've got a basic action and we've got a successful action. Instead of having inside of basic action, if success, do this, if error, do that, we've now got separated um, cases. OK, so uh, let's finally get to the actual root of the problem. Why am I talking about all of these things? I'm talking about both thunks and, uh, and sagas because of spooky action at a distance. You know when you're uh, debugging something and um, it's doing something you're not expecting, but like way on the other side of the code base that it shouldn't be touching? This is spooky action. Uh, and let's just take an example of a bug. Let's just think conceptually about a bug that's happening in the debugger. When you're opening a loaded source, uh, the source blinks. Like it loads, and then it disappears, and then it loads again. Why does that happen? Uh, let's, uh, okay, so I know this bug. I know how it works. I know why it works the way it does, so I'm just going to walk you through it. We have um, this, uh, these are, this is what's happening in the code. This is pseudocode for what's happening in, in the um, debugger. We've got an event, new source. Fire new source event. New source is called, it dispatches add source, and then it says maybe add a source map. Maybe this thing has this thing called a source map and we need to add it. And for that, we load the source map and add original sources. Uh, what these things actually do doesn't matter. Uh, just what uh, the, the rhythm of it matters is what really matters here. Then uh, maybe select the source, in which case we're going to load source text. And then we're going to reevaluate the breakpoints. And then we're going to dispatch add breakpoints. And then after that, maybe add breakpoints. Um, oh, I just realized that these are backwards. Those are backwards. Um, load source text and dispatch select source. So maybe you've noticed, but we've got load source text happening twice, maybe. These two things might happen, and they're happening twice. What is load source text? Load source text is used in two places, and it's costly. Uh, and it also clears itself. I'm just describing the functions for you, because if we go into the code, everyone's going to go cross-eyed before the end of the talk. Um, and here's the source of the bug. Uh, 
This is written as a thunk. And uh, you see that we've got an await. It's async and we've got an await. We're dispatching lots of things. So this is a dispatch. This, this is also a dispatch. This is a dispatch. Everything in this, there are four dispatches in this function. And we're waiting for this one. OK? Uh, I want to draw your attention to two, these two pieces of code. This one is not waiting, and this one is. Now, when we look inside of these two pieces of code, we see that they both have a condition that says, if the source is selected, dispatch this piece of, uh, dispatch this action. And if we have breakpoints, which is if breakpoints.length, breakpoints is an array, uh, then dispatch load source text again. And if both of these are true, we're going to dispatch twice, right? And in this case, we're waiting for both of them. But if we look back here, we see that we're not waiting. And this is one of the issues with, uh, the, uh, with uh, thunks, in that it's not very explicit about what's going on. So um, what we're seeing here, this dispatch, this select source, and this dispatch are all fire and forget. And this one, we're holding on to it and being like, let's wait and see what happens when this resolves. All right. There's a solution to this, and you can probably see where the, the bug was. We, needed, we were waiting in the wrong spot. We needed to wait here. And then we could call this one, because then we're not loading source text twice. Because uh, there's a slide missing, but um, load source text has a condition that if it's already loaded, that uh, don't reload it, just return it as it was. So here we've got uh, a wait for if we're going to load the source text, first load it, and then check the breakpoints. And this is a very easy mistake to make, because probably someone came into this code and was like, oh, I'm just going to switch these two lines because they're in the wrong order, but didn't realize that, they, that both of them were asynchronous and that they both needed a wait statements in order for the code to work. That's because it isn't explicit. Let's take a look at another solution using sagas. And again, we're looking at a lot of new code. So this is something that a lot of people who work with JavaScript every day don't see. So if you're getting a bit lost, just grab me later. I'm very happy to explain how this is working. Uh, okay, so let's see how Sagas tackles this problem. We are taking every new source and we are putting it through this process where we are dispatching the ad source and uh, we are forking our process in three directions because uh, for the sake of performance, we don't want to wait for everything to finish. We just want to fire these three things, get them to run, and then uh, when they're done, we want to wrap it all up and say this is a successful action. So we forked them and just run them independently. And we know that they're running independently. We know that they're asynchronous. And uh, we know that they all need to resolve before this is successful. We join all of those together and we return a successful uh, uh, callback if it is successful. Ah, I'm missing a thing. OK, um, another thing that I want to mention about sagas is they give you a lot of control over your asynchronous code. You have blocking and non-blocking functions. So non-blocking are take every. So uh, for those of you who are perhaps not as familiar with this terminology, a blocking function is something that stops the process and says, wait until this is done, and then continue. And then a non-blocking operation is like, eh, this is happening. That's happening. That's also fine. Like It's just all running at the same time. Um, and you'll notice that uh, I was just using a fork there. Forks are non-blocking, so they just run. Uh, join, on the other hand, is blocking. So you'll notice that we wait for these three processes to join together, and then we run. Yeah. So uh, the, it's the interplay between these two different types of methods that you can use in sagas that makes it really useful. You have a lot of control over when things run in sagas and why. Now, uh, two other things that I want to bring up is the blocking put, because you can make put blocking. Put is um, very similar to dispatch, and it essentially does the same thing as dispatch. So you're putting a action, and that's going down to the um, uh, reducer. And we want to do this sometimes because we want the reducer to respond before we finish whatever we're doing. And the other thing that I want to bring up is uh, channels. So before we had take every, so this is the simple case in Sagas where we're taking every version, uh, every single basic action. And then the other one is uh, the action channel. Action channel is not taking, it is taking everything, but it's keeping a queue. So rather than just taking everything and just running it through, 
action channel is building up a queue. Um, unfortunately, we lost the slide for load source text, but this is what load source text looks like in sagas. So we have an action channel that's taking in a stream of events and queuing them, and we have an infinite loop here, well true. Uh, we pull the payload out of the request channel, which is the source, and if the source text exists, already exists, uh, we just return the source directly, right? As I mentioned, there's a condition in load source text that uh, if the source text uh, exists, just return. If it doesn't, do the asynchronous process, and the bug was coming from the asynchronous process wouldn't be finished in time for um, the second call to happen. So what we're doing here is, if it exists, just return it. Same thing as the thunk code. Otherwise, uh, call it. And the, diff the main difference here is that this is a queue. So we're pulling events from the queue rather than being called by the events to run. Uh, thunks are called, sagas call uh, events out of the queue. So that's a fundamental difference between the two methods. If you have a number of, of um, events that are happening in your code and what's happening is that they're getting mixed up and they're interfering with each other, this might be something to look at because this way you know which events you're working with and you can control them at a really fine level. This is really, this is, uh, from my side, this type of scheduling is the main benefit of sagas. And, um, yeah, so here we have just uh, uh, the, the, regu the saga for the load source text, which you see is relatively simple. The, the complicated thing that's happening here is in the watch load, sor load, so uh, load source text. And then the source text itself is actually a simple saga. Um, All right, All right. so uh, we can actually do more with sagas because sagas give us this fine-grained control. So we're now looking at this load source text uh, again. And instead of uh, calling that load source text saga down here, we're going to do something else. We're going to do something interesting. Uh, what if, for example, we have an error? Maybe there's a 404. Maybe the network is timed out. And we want to roll forward on that error. So rather, uh, if you implement this as a thunk or if you implement this as a basic promise, you're going to have to go into that, um, you're going to have to do error handling on your own. Whereas here, like, you're just using a regular try-catch block. It's almost like it's synchronous. And you're just, you know, calling a delay and then running this thing again. Like, all right, let's give it a minute and let's try it again. And uh, if within five times you don't get a proper response, you just say, okay, it's a load source text error. Like, we're not going to show that. Maybe you want to do something else entirely. Like, you know that if you get an error, like a specific type of error, well, uh, okay, and we actually have this bug. Um, let's say you're navigating really fast and you have the debugger open. Well, the debugger is going to try and open the source text for every single page that you pass. And uh, that source doesn't exist anymore because you've navigated past it already and the debugger is a little bit slower. So what we actually want to do is we don't even want to tell the user that we haven't been able to load the source because it's irrelevant, so we just delete the source. Like, we don't care about that source anymore. You can also do this with canceling. There's a lot of, there's a lot of methods in sagas. Like, sagas give you really fine-grained control over asynchronous code. And uh, just taking another look at the thunk reducer, like before, we would handle all of our errors in here, or we would have to handle them in our actions. Either our actions would get bloated, or our reducers would get bloated. The saga reducers, we're just taking simple actions, and we just have, um, uh, reducer cases. So like you have a source error, you just have an error. And maybe you have a reducer that's dedicated to errors and you can use any error out of that reducer. You can pick and choose uh, what you want to happen to your state. Let's, let's look at a couple of observations. Um, I'm talking about a really complicated case. I'm talking about the Firefox debugger and that thing talks to three different service workers, a server and a user. Like, this is a much more complex thing than most applications. For most applications, simple promises are enough. You don't even need uh, thunks. You can just write it as a simple promise outside of your action and then pass in, uh, and then just trigger the action once the promise is returned. Thunks are useful as well if you need eager updates and error handling on the reducer. Let's say um, you need to load a widget 
and you're doing a call to the uh, server, and you want to give the user some kind of feedback, like you want to show a UI, a spinner or something like this, then you definitely want to use thunks because they give you that start and end and error. So you can display the different uh, states of that specific element, and uh, you can think of it as like thunks should be really for single API calls. Like if you've got a single call to the API and a single response, it's simple, then you probably want to use thunks. Sagas are useful when working with complex scheduling tasks. This is when you're doing like 10 different things and you need to talk to a lot of different services. Um, so a problem that we were having on the debugger is we have uh, deeply nested dispatches. Um, you might remember this big list of what happens when we're calling new source. This is all dispatches. Everything that's going on there is dispatches and it gets very messy very quickly. Uh, Sagas are a great solution to that. Uh, there are criticisms of both thunks and sagas, and I just want to go through them really quickly. Uh, they are too powerful and do too much, both of them, and this is true, they are. Uh, they uh, break with, well, true is a difficult word to use here. They basically break with the pattern of flux, and they let you do anything without restricting you very much, which can lead to very messy code unless you're very careful. Discipline is a topic that came up yesterday. You need a lot of discipline to use these two technologies. If you don't have it, your code base is going to be a mess. Uh, a lot of the same can be achieved with promises, as I mentioned before. So you don't necessarily need either of these libraries. A lot of people are like, oh, how do I deal with this async problem? You might actually get away with just promises. Uh, and uh, we had flutures yesterday. Flutures are an um, alternative to promises, and you can definitely use flutures as well. You don't need either library. You can use promises, something else that does async. You can use Ajax. You can use XHR if you really want to. Um, two criticisms of both of them that are independent to one another. Uh, thunks lead to duplicate async logic. This is true. Uh, sagas and generators are difficult to understand. I spent, I think, five or ten minutes explaining what uh, generators are because you won't understand sagas unless you understand generators. And generators are not something people use every day. Uh, and this learning curve will be a breaking point for a lot of teams. Like, it's just not worth it for a lot of teams to learn this really complex scheduling unless you really need it. Uh, let's quickly take a look at some positive parts of Thunks. You can use them right away. It's promises. They're easy to understand. They're simple to write. You can get started with them without any uh, heavy reading. Uh, it works for a large number of cases. And it's great. It's, it's really good for eager updates, which, you know, most of the web, that's, that's what you want. Like, you want something eager. Like, the user does something. You don't want to wait for an API response in order to get back to them. You just want to show them an update right away. Some positive aspects of sagas. Um, sagas are great for testing. They return simple objects, and they're basically functional. So you can just pass it in uh, some uh, uh, functional in the sense of you give it an input, it get, you get the output uh, that you expect. It is definitely doing a lot of side effects stuff, so it's not functional. But uh, in terms of the black box input output, in, same input always has the same output. Um, it handles complex scheduling very well, as we've seen, and it allows for fine-grained control over what happens in the system, as we've seen. Uh, so maybe one thing that you guys are wondering is, like, what do we do in the end? Because this, was, uh, this talk is sort of a prep for our internal discussion of uh, what we're going to do on the debugger. We're sticking with thunks for now, and there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, while difficult to maintain, thunks currently work, and the community is familiar with them. We want the community to know what we're doing before we implement something of this scale. This is a huge refactoring. Uh, and it's not the right time because we're doing a major release. Firefox 57 is coming out in November. It's the biggest release we've done in a number of years. We've changed a lot of things. The browser is faster. We've ripped out a lot of the internals. So it's not the right time. But, you know, we are planning on potentially introducing them. Uh, so uh, we need to get our community ready for the change. And uh, we've discussed with core community members about this change. We've also received feedback from the maintainers of Redux Saga, and we've experimented on a small scale. To give you an idea of how we do things at the debugger uh, on the uh, uh, Firefox DevTools, we do everything in the open. So if you want to watch our process, you can go online to GitHub and see what we're doing. Um, as an example, we've done a major refactoring of this scale before, uh, which was um, converting our components to JSX, 
Uh, prior to about a month ago, all of our components were written in a deprecated method, uh, which was um, dom.div. I'm not sure if anybody's used uh, React DOM and dom.div syntax in, in uh, uh, React. Uh, but we did this major refactoring, and the, the, the way that we got to this point was always with the community, talking to the community, making sure everybody knew why this change was happening and what was going on. Uh, and everybody got involved. All of these pull requests are done by different members of the community. And maybe we're going to do the same thing with Sagas. So maybe, maybe, uh, perhaps you're interested. Maybe you want to get involved. This is the URL. Uh, come talk to me after if you have any questions, uh, and thank you so much.